Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 61 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I am one week out from foot surgery and two days away from hand surgery. I live with my husband and a giant chocolate labradoodle in the southwest corner of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. So if you're new, welcome. Um, some of you have been with me since the very beginning, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I Rock Knits is just Corey spelled backwards, and I sit in a rocker recliner to do all, and so it seemed to be an appropriate little moniker for me. If you haven't heard that story before, you can find me all over the internet as I Rock Knits on Ravelry, Instagram, Etsy, all the places, Pinterest. So um, I just threw on a little um, cowl that is going to be a gift to my mother. I don't think she watches this on the regular, but it was sitting <laughs> on the edge of the chair here. One of the things that needs to be wrapped for Christmas. It is the Pretty Leaves by Stephanie Boyer. It came in the Knit Crate box, and I showed you all several times the beautiful, stunning Malabrigo um, that was used to knit it. Uh, very uh, interesting construction cowl with a V in the front. Um, the two um, skeins were very mismatched, so alternating skeins was absolutely a necessity. And um, yeah, it's pretty. I think she'll love it. Her favorite color is blue, but um, when I saw this, it made me think of her. It has purple with blue in it. The picture in the book was very blue and um, not not really close to the color <laughs> that I actually received if either one of these is true on your on your camera so it's gonna be a really short um, quick episode today I'm not gonna do all my regular song and dance but I did get my shawl back um, from the photo shoot so I'm gonna talk a bit about that I have a couple books and a recipe just wanted you all to kind of know that I'm doing okay and hanging in there and I'll tell you more about that in Corey's stories so I have finished reading two audiobooks this week, and the first one was an oldie that I had never read that had been recommended to me a hundred times, and I had just never gotten around to it, and it was The Night Circus by Erin Morgan, Morgan Stern, Morgan Stern, yes, <laughs> and um, I, I didn't love it. Now. I have had a lot going on in my life the last month and I don't think my brain was in a place to really follow it and um, and do it justice. So I'm not going to say that it's a bad book or that I disliked it. It just, I thought it, I, I kind of felt like it was plodding along in places and I wasn't that interested and you know that has to do with my state of mind for sure. So I'm just going to read you um, a little bit about, about what it's about. For those of you who haven't ever read it, which there are many of you left out there, I don't think. The circus arrives without warning. No announcements preceded. It is simply there when yesterday it was not. Within the black and white striped canvas tents is an utterly unique experience full of breathtaking amazement. It's called Le Cirque des Rêves, and it is only open at night. But behind the scenes, a fierce competition is underway, a duel between two young ma magicians, Celia and Marco, who have been trained since childhood expressly for this purpose by their mercurial instructors. Unbeknownst to them, there is a game in which only one can be left standing, and the circus is but the stage for a remarkable battle of imagination and will. I guess going in, it is good to know that it is magical, fantasy, um, you know, mystery, uh, all those things because I didn't realize that about the book. I didn't expect it to be so magical and filled with that kind of background. I, I didn't have any idea. Um, and so it, you know, it was a, an okay listen for me. Um, for those of you that absolutely love it, I will probably have to listen to it again someday when my head is in a, in a better spot <laughs> or something is a little bit more um, engaging um, to keep me. I just didn't find it super suspenseful. I kind of figured like, I don't know, they're going to fall in love, right? They're going to fall in love. And when they do, it's no surprise. And then one of them is going to have to sacrifice themselves for the other, which they then they both try to do. It's, I don't know. I'm a little cynical these days. Okay. 
The other book that I listened to, um, I did really like. The second book is called Daisy Jones and the Six. It came highly recommended. It's by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Uh, and I just finished it this afternoon on my way to get my COVID test for my surgery on Wednesday. Uh, I found it fascinating. It was told in a form that I had not often heard before. So I'm gonna read you a little bit about what it is. A gripping novel about the whirlwind rise of an iconic 1970s rock group and their beautiful lead singer revealing the mystery behind their infamous breakup. Daisy is a girl coming of age in LA in the late 60s, sneaking into clubs on the Sunset Strip, sleeping with rock stars, and dreaming of singing at the Whiskey A Go Go. The sex and drugs are thrilling, but it's the rock and roll she loves the most. Uh, the Six, a band led by the brooding Billy Dunn, on the eve of their first tour, his girlfriend Camilla finds out she's pregnant, and with the pressure of impending fatherhood and fame, Billy go goes a little while on the road. This audiobook is read by celebrities, and they all do a different voice, and that's the only thing that's really in the book, is the person's name, and then them talking, and then another person telling their side of the story. It's fascinating to listen to. I can't imagine reading it and trying to keep all the voices straight in your head. But it's read by Jennifer Beals, uh, Pablo Schreiber, Benjamin Bratt, Fred Berman, read by Judy Greer, uh, January Lavoy, Robin Lee, like, you know, some big name people, there's a whole list here. I'm trying to scan down. Um, so they'll say the person's name. So the, the guy will say like, Billy, and then he'll talk in Billy's voice and tell his side of the conversation that happened. And then Daisy will go, Daisy, and then she'll tell her part of it. It was a really, really interesting listen because of that format. And the story is heartbreaking and um, sad as all rock and roll <laughs> stories are wont to go, but it has, there's a lot of intrigue and mystery and stuff that happens um, kind of, you know, are they gonna be able to make it? Or are they gonna be able to perform on the road when they're all doing drugs and they're all mad at one another? And so I found it very interesting, not anything like something that I would normally pick or that I had ever read before. And the subject matter of like a rock and roll band just wouldn't seem to appeal, but the way it is written. And it's um, so at the very end when they're they're telling about where they are now, um, that comes out that he's talking about her mother. And um, yeah, it, it was it was really good. So Daisy Jones and the Six, I, I would rank that. Um, a definitely definitely a great reading experience listening experience yeah I have a recipe this week I made it because of leftover turkey from Thanksgiving and uh, I thought oh I'm gonna throw that in on the table so that I remember to talk about it so this is wild rice potato cheese soup and basically it's a dump recipe you put everything in the pot and cook it so it's not too difficult. Um, it calls for 10 slices of bacon browned with onion. I leave that out completely, um, mostly because I just don't want the mess of doing the bacon. The first couple times I made it, I made it with the bacon. I am, I like bacon plain by itself, but I don't like bacon in things. So I don't like bacon in salads, I don't like bacon in omelets, you know, that kind of thing on pizza. <laughs> so I leave it out, but I think it does give it great flavor. If you're a bacon fan, you should definitely put it in. An onion chopped, one and a half cups of parboiled carrots, um, one half a cup of wild rice. So you cook it first and drain it. And that's the biggest, you know, prep that you have to do is to cook your wild rice down. And then one pint of half and half, three cans of cream of potato soup, and you can sub in um, cream of celery, cream of mushroom. If you don't like cream soups, you can sub in chicken broth or you can also use just more cream liquid, so more half and half or more milk. Um, two cups of milk, one and a half cups of grated American cheese, one and a half cups of grated cheddar cheese, uh, one can or box of mushrooms fresh or from the can, depending on what you have on hand, uh, one small box of peas. And then you can add two cups of shredded chicken, cubed chicken, shredded turkey, cubed turkey, 
whatever you have on hand can be added for meat. And basically you just dump that all together and, and heat it up. And it's really creamy and really cheesy, but very hearty because it's got peas and carrots and mushrooms and potatoes in it. And so it's, it's just a really hearty uh, meal. Um, my husband's not a huge fan of cream soup. He's kind of a purist. He's, um, he doesn't eat anything that's bad for him. And so I sent him to the grocery store to buy some of the stuff and I told him that he needed to buy milk and that if he would get, you know, 2% or whole milk or whipping cream, uh, cream half and half, that it would make the soup better. And he's like, that's just so much fat. <laughs> yes, honey, and that's what makes it delicious. He did buy it. But so it's very creamy, makes a big pot, it's delicious. Um, and it worked great with the turkey and made it feel like you weren't eating turkey again for another meal. So there you go. Wild rice potato cheese soup might be on your radar if you're having cold winter nights. I have a bit of a tip that someone shared with me. I had asked um, many of you to write to my mother-in-law, May, and I had such a terrific response. And I just want to say thank you all so much. She's feeling bad that she can't write you all back quickly, but her handwriting has gotten very poor. She's very shaky. It's difficult to read, and she's trying to do her Christmas letters in which she writes a letter to 60 different people on her Christmas list. And I told her, no worries. And she said lots of people are asking her about Minnesota and she'd love to write back. And she's just having a ball. She got seven letters one day and two people sent her a word find. And so she got that in the mail and someone sent a postcard and she's getting lovely cards. And she, every day she calls and she's kind of giddy. She's, she's laughing and she's kind of happy and it just, it's been amazing. So thank you all. If you volunteered, some of you I pushed off a week or so to try to you know keep, the, keep it going for a little bit. And I do think that eventually she will try to write some of you, but for right now, she's trying to do her Christmas cards and get them out to people. And um, I said, no one's going to be sitting at the mailbox waiting for you to write them back right away. Um, May. I know she got someone who's older than she is that wrote to her, someone who's 92 or 93, and um, and so she, she was just tickled with that, that, you know, there was someone else that was older than her that was writing, so, and then she tells me what they're about and what cities they come from, and I mean, you guys just, you rocked it for me. <laughs> that was so nice. But someone got in touch and said, Corey, you might want to sign your mother-in-law up for this um, new initiative that these two young girls started and I went over and looked at it and I was like wow that's awesome so it's a website called letters against isolation and it's also um, they have an email address it's letters against isolation at gmail.com and it's these two young girls who set up during quarantine to write letters to people who are alone and you can send your name or your person's name or address in and then they're trying to match up people and they're doing it in I don't know maybe five countries already and they they send out letters every day and they write um to people and then people ask for more people to be written to and yeah it's just a great great thing I don't feel like May is in need of that right now like she's gotten so many and she's going to continue to get some letters and um, little things from people so I I'm not gonna sign her up but if you have someone or if you want to participate in that like if you want to just write the same letter maybe over and over a few times and then envelope it up and send it in you know send it off to different people I I just think what a great feeling that would give you during quarantine that you wrote a letter to someone who's isolated and sad or tired or you know dealing with quarantine. Oh, yeah. So letters against isolation. Another tip I have this week is uh, a little thing that I found in the Vogue knitting.com store. And I was like, Oh, what a great concept here. So you can buy a knitting color work paper from their website. I think it's like $12. And you get a pack of paper that has the knitted um, shape on it can you see if I hold it up here 
how it's got the knit stitches. I'll put it on the screen, maybe that would be easier, but for knitters who enjoy creating their own color work patterns, Vogue Knitting Color Work Paper is a fun and effective way to do just that. Now, in my ebook, I included a page of graph paper, knitter's graph paper, and knitter's graph paper is different than regular graph paper because your stitches are shorter than they are, you know, wide, and so knitter's graph paper, in order to get things to look to the right proportion, you want to use knitter's graph paper. And um, so I'm assuming that this would also be that proportion. But I also include a coloring chart. So if you want to see what your colors look like and you have um, kids' colors or colored pencils or markers, I bought a big pack of, you know, 120 markers or something of all the colors, all the shades. And I just color in to kind of see what my contrast will be like if I'm going to use different colors all the way throughout, like the knit words uh, patterns. So this would also work if you wanted to just chart your little design or uh, make your own little pattern on a hat or a cowl or something that you were knitting. Um, I think that would be great. So it, it came out in September that they were adding this to their website. And so I just put a copy of it in my folder so that you could all go over and take a look at that if you were interested at all. Let's talk just a bit about my new shawl design. This is the Very Merry Mix-Up Shawl. And a Very Merry Mix-Up is the name of a Christmas Hallmark movie. So you can all go out and watch that. And you know the storyline already. She gets mixed up. <laughs> and there's an airport scene and um, she meets the wrong guy and then she goes to his house and it's the wrong person. She doesn't realize it's a whole mix-up. But I was looking for a title and I was using the Toad Hollow Mini Skeins Advent Minis for this year. But they didn't send me this year's minis. They sent me last year's minis because my, my shawl was gonna come out December 1st for people to knit and they don't wanna spoil your surprise. So we knitted up in last year's minis and they have that shawl right now. I had Amber, after she took the photograph, ship it to them so they could show it on their podcast. And then I have the other, um, sample that I had knit so that you would have two different versions to kind of look at. So the pastel version or the kind of toned down version is the Toad Hollow Advents and they were 24 minis that were a little um, soft and gentle at the beginning and then got you know a little bit brighter toward the middle and got it was a little hard to match up exactly how I wanted it to lay out. When you're knitting this advent, if you're that kind of person who can throw caution to the wind, then you will just grab a mini skein out of what, wherever you keep your mini skeins and you'll just knit with it next and see how it comes out. Very merry mix up, right? You just mix them all up and use them as they come. But if you're more like me and you like symmetry and you want things to kind of be in a certain order, and to coordinate and match, because I kind of like matching, then I purchased Knit Picks mini skeins and they have those on sale. Um, the last I looked, they were, the mini skein sets were like $17, and I used the Radiant Reds, I think it's called, and I used, I think, three mini skeins packs, so there were five in the kit, and then I sent like five packages of them to my sample knitter. And I said, okay. And then when she got them, she said, what order do you want them to go in? And I said, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, you know, so from lightest to darkest, lightest to darkest. And she said, I don't know if that's the way you want them to go. They could go one, five, two, four, three, three, or they could go five, four, three, two, one. You could go from darkest to lightest, or you could mix them up. You could go one, 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 one. So the whole bottom of it would be the light pink and then two, 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 and then three, three, three. But we didn't know how exactly how many minis it was gonna take us to get through, you know, cause when you're doing sample knitting, you know that each stripe is gonna be, so you're gonna do in this section, two rows of boxes. And so um, we just went with the one, two, three, four, five. So we started um, with the dark, color at the very bottom because I liked that little ruffle to be weighted at the bottom to have a little also on the 
pastel version, we did that in kind of a purpley gray to kind of give it some weight. So when you first cast on, the whole thing is just knit flat. So you could do it on flat needles if you chose to. You cast on extra stitches and you knit three rows and then you decrease them away and you just get this little ruffle. So you do have quite a few stitches to cast on at the beginning, but then they're decreased away, you know, pretty quickly. And then you just are knitting in stockinette and stripes. So there's no pattern in this section, except it's on the bias. So you're knitting it it's getting, see how it kind of hangs on the bias? It's getting um, shorter on one side and longer on the other. So you're knitting two together and then making one on the other end. And then when you knit halfway through the shawl on the other side, you do the opposite so that they both hang on a really nice angle until you get to this section right here where you do yarn over, knit two together, yarn over, knit two together across here and a couple of purl rows and you get holes there. And when you're all done, you knit some long I-cord, two pieces of long I-cord, and you weave that I-cord in and out, in and out, in and out, throughout those, and you go up, then you turn around, you come back down the second row of eyelets, and then your two pieces of I-cord hang out the bottom. So as you can see here, these two pieces of I-cord can be tied in a knot or a bow um, and if you're always going to cinch it, you can make your I-cord shorter. On the pastel version, we left them very, very long. And on this version, they're much shorter. So if I stretch this out, you can see how that happens. And then um, when Amber had Heidi try it on, you can wrap it around your neck from front to back and then bring the tails around to the front again. And then you can tie those I cords in a knot or a bow. Um, you could use ribbon here. If you didn't want to knit the I cord, you could just put some beautiful ribbon through that those holes. You don't have to do the I cord at all. If you choose not to, just want it to be a big rectangle with biased ends on it. That's your prerogative. Um, and then you start this what it's called little boxes and it's just um, a pearl row with some knits in between and then it's you just are making these little boxes and you do two rows in each color so you do have that um, striping thing that's going on where you're like oh well I'll just knit the next few rows and get to the next color and then I'll put it down or and then I'll knit the next few rows and get to the next color and then I'll knit the next few rows and get to the next color so uh, it does kind of motivate you to get along when you get the first half done, you knit the entire second half the exact same way from the beginning, although you're doing your bias the opposite direction. Um, and then you graft it together in the middle and I used a brand new graft that someone um, talked about on a podcast that I watch. And so I went over and took a look at it and it's easy, it's easier than the Kitchener. It's quick, it doesn't, um, it doesn't require a lot of concentration and memory in order to do it. So there's a video, YouTube video, linked in the pattern as well as written instructions for that. But if you love to Kitchener and Kitchener is your jam, then you can still do the Kitchener. And if you hate both grafting methods and you want to just three needle bind off straight up the back, you'll just have a tiny little seam straight up the back. See that it mirrors here coming into the center and you meet here in the middle and there's just a little bit wider of a stripe right here in the center where you bring bring those two together and then this is the part that would sit at your elbow so if it's cinched in it really does provide almost a little lock <laughs> where it can sit at your elbow uh, that little cinch part sits right here and it stays on stays over your shoulders you can then bring those ties up and tie it around. You can tie one tie or two ties. There are multiple ways to wear it, but I'm gonna show you that little cinched part up close here. See how they come out of that? Yeah. So, and then if you just, if you want it to spread them out a little bit, they just cinch down like this. And, and this is, I'm gonna stretch it all the way out so that you hardly have any cinching done at the there. If you don't have any cinching, you will see how it takes kind of a, a turn here at the bottom where your ruffle happens. 
And so it's shaped like this and then chomp down on the sides. I tried to explain all of that on the last podcast and I did have a few of you say, I'm not really sure about your new shawl pattern. I don't really know what you're talking about. Of course, I could see it in my mind's eye what I was talking about, but not everybody. I do mention in the pattern is that you should buy an I-cord maker because it will save you <laughs> on many iterations of things that you might be knitting in the future. And you can get a little I-cord maker on Amazon where you just drop your string through the top. And I've shown it on the podcast before, but some of you haven't watched all the old episodes, but you just drop it through and you just crank it and it makes I-cord for you. So um, on the first shawl, the one that Toad Hollow, Hollow has, I just cranked and cranked and cranked and cranked until I had cranked, you know, most of the mini skein. And then I cut it in half um, for the two different sides. And I took, I don't know, 20 minutes at the most to get the whole thing done. So that's what I recommend in the pattern. And like I said, if you want to use ribbon in this section, I think that would be fine too. But if you've got mini skeins laying around or if you've got some leftover sock yarn and you love, let's say blue, you love lots of shades of blue. So you've got tons of blue sock yarn left over. You can make your own, you know, gradient. You can decide to, there are 23 stripes between the center back and the bottom. And so you could count out, you know, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, one, two, three, however many colors you wanted to put in it. If you have leftover fade kits, you might have seven colorways, and you could, and they're not, this isn't faded, so I don't think it would look the same at all. I think it would come out really stripey, which I think is, is kind of fun. And there's that little um, boxes stitch. So, yeah, I, I have to thank Amy <laughs> for knitting this um, because she knit this so fast for me. I put a call out and said, I have to have a second sample knit for this and we have photography set and is there anybody could, that could knit this in the next two and a half weeks and have it done and shipped before Thanksgiving? And Amy and I was said, I, I can do it. And I hadn't ordered the yarn. I had. Oh, had the yarn shipped to her and she was ready to go and she just blew it out of the water. I mean, her knitting is exquisite. It's beautiful. She literally had to, you know, just barrel down. And I knew that with my bad thumb and my good thumb that isn't quite perfect yet, I could never have gotten it. I couldn't have knit that much to get it done. The last thing I want to show is the edge on this. This has a really fun little edge stitch all the way along that keeps it from rolling. I think you can all see that, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so it's got a couple of things that are new that you would never have tried before. And then it's really easy knitting, like easy peasy. Once you've done that edge, probably, you know, twice, you're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I know how it goes for the rest of the shawl. Once you do the first section of um, bias knitting, you're like, okay, I get it. I decrease on this end and increase on the other, and I got markers there to remind me. And then when you get to this section, you're like, okay, little boxes, that gives me something to do every now and then, and it all stacks on itself so I can read my knitting and I can say, oh, I'm you know, purling all the way up here, and then every so many rows I do a purl. So, pretty mindless and I would say you know good television knitting good being in the company of other people knitting once once you get the, started and you get the ruffle done you know this is just all stockinette at the bottom except for the bias and then you get to do the fun thing where you do the little and if I were doing it I would set it up on two needles and I would knit you know three sections on this and then three sections on the other and then four sections on this and then four sections on the other or then the eyelets on this end and the eyelets on the other and I would knit them in tandem because that for my brain works I would I would be doing the same the only problem and I put a note in the pattern is that when you're doing this bias you might go into muscle memory and decrease at the beginning of row and increase at the end and on this side 
you are increasing at the beginning and decreasing at the end. So you might like have that muscle memory and be like, oh, do my edge stitches, knit two together across, oh shoot, no, increase on this end. So you might wanna hang like two or three stitch markers on the end of this one, like on each other, right? So it's a longer, have you ever done that? When you have to remember to do something, that's what I do. I clip two or three or four stitch markers so that they're in the way. They're kind of a, a pain to move and I go, oh, that's right. I'm doing something different here than I think I'm doing. And uh, then I flip them over and say, okay, now you're increasing on this end. And the ruffle is just a tiny little ruffle. Okay, I've gone on and on. <laughs> I just wanted to show it because I didn't get to show it on the last you know, podcast. There's another little way to wear this. <laughs> you can just tie those ties in all different directions. I put it on and I thought, oh, if I turn that around upside down, I can tie it the other way. So it does provide with you with kind of a lot of different ways to do it. Could it be done in one color? Absolutely. If you have a beautiful kind of tonal or even lightly variegated skein, yeah, you could totally do it. Okay, I have one little other thing to show you today. Some of you are new to the podcast and have never seen this little hat before. And I was getting some um, stuff out of the <laughs> chest over here that I have a lot of my samples in. And this is my Chim Chim Chimney hat. And it also could use an I-cord maker. So if you're thinking, oh, I don't wanna buy an I-cord maker just to make I-cord on one shawl, this is an option also. I did um, knit my own I-cord on this one. It is worsted weight. And this is just a really <laughs> fun hat to knit. It is color work, so you do strand your colors across the back, and it is flat. So when you open up your head hole, it does look like a chimney on top with a garland. And I've had a number of people take those little light up lights that have a little battery and string them around the garland. I had a whole family, a grandma made um, hats for all the grandchildren and they took pictures in these. So it, this is a fun hat to make. It is available on Ravelry, uh, Etsy and Lovecrafts. And so if you are looking for a real fun, pretty quick knit, uh, you could knit the hat in an evening. This is the larger size. Um, on a couple of them originally, I, I used that kind of snowflake yarn down here. That was fun. You know, it's not fun to knit with, but it really looked, <laughs> it really looked cute. And I did have um, some people who knit this using slip stitches and they just drug this stitch up and I'm not sure, but I think they might have wrapped it twice um, on that first row and then you know unwrapped it and slipped it up so they didn't have to do color work knitting. And so there are a couple of examples out there, I think, in the projects on Ravelry. So if you're not a color work knitter, I've never knit color work before, this would be an easy one to start with because it's like knit five red, knit one white, knit five red, knit one white. And you know, and then every so often you knit a white row. But yeah, and then you bind off with the seam on the outside. So no fit, no real finishing, easy to do. Then you can make these little colored lights. It's kind of like making a, a bobble you cast on and you knit like five stitches and then you, you cast it off and then you tie knot and cut it. <laughs> so the, the pokiest part of the whole thing is just knitting, you know, tying these in. And I just took a needle and I ran one one way and one of the tails the other way through that I-cord and that's how I put it on. No rhyme or reason, tie it in a knot, get it on there, right? Like it doesn't have to be something that is, and then I just st stitch this on loosely, like I just tacked it down in a couple of places. So chim chimney hat. If you put chim chim in on Ravelry, it does come up <laughs> because chimney, not everybody knows how to spell chimney the first time they they go to look it up to see if there's anything named that on Ravelry. So I thought I'd share that because of the I-cord. Okay, I just have a tiny little bit of news about the soft cover book and its availability. My patterns are getting put up on my website right now and the book is available there. You can purchase the book. The shipping is not available yet. <laughs> Um, I've done two practice shifts and the first one, the postage was too high, it was too much and we offered two ways to ship it and I'm only gonna offer the kind of priority general mail 
way to ship it, which is going to be run most people about three dollars in some sense. Um, the book is twenty dollars, and then there's some shipping, handling, and the postage that is added on to that. And I'm hoping to get that all sorted tomorrow. But you guys are the only ones right now that know that the book is on the website. So if you want to order it and you're okay with knowing that I just have to figure out how to ship it via TPS, I send them an Excel spreadsheet of all the names and addresses and then they do it. And that piece for me hasn't worked yet. <laughs> I'm getting there, I'm getting closer, but I need a little technical assistance from the people at TPS um, to help me with that but it will be then shipped to you and I will do it every couple of days once it gets going. So if you are like, hey, I just know I wanna buy it, I want it to come and I'm um, able to wait, you know, depending on my surgery and how I feel, I'm able to wait five to seven days before she gets that part figured out, you could go buy it. If you go over to my website and it looks like it's under construction, that means that Jean, who's my website developer, is putting patterns up. She's trying to get all my patterns up and I had to write like little descriptions and the pricing and um, the sizing for each of the patterns and I, I don't know, there were 44 that I still had to do and I just got those to her so each day she goes on and you know does takes about 15 minutes to do one and then the site might look like it's unavailable for a short period of time. But then once that happens, all my patterns will be up on the site as well as the PDF download of the book and the hard, the soft color cover version of the book. And I know a lot of you said that you wanted to get the soft cover book and I really hope to have it done by today. But uh, it just, I just don't have it. I, I'm missing. I'm missing a piece on how to take the addresses off the website and put them in the Excel spreadsheet without having to retype them because that's when mistakes happen. And there's there's a piece, but I just haven't, I, I have calls into both places, my web person and TPS to, to get it done. And I was gone today for a little bit of time to go drive across the city and get that COVID test done. And, and so I just wanted to let you know that if you go to the website, the stuff is there, um, but I don't have it quite ready to ship. It's close. And, and I wouldn't lose them. They're all, they all, I get a, you know, an email that you purchased it, and whatever. I just don't have it quite ready. Otherwise, wait a week or so, and I will send out an email blast. So if you're on my website subscriber list, you'll get an email blast to tell you that it's ready to go because I have already written that email. It's like all laid out and I, all I have to do is hit send and it'll go out to the people who are on that subscriber list so that they know it's up and ready and working, okay? Okay, I got a little story to tell. Of course I do. And then we're gonna be done today. I'm really tired. <laughs> I had a COVID test today and I drove myself, it was a drive up test and I drove myself, I don't know, 45 minutes across the city and I and my husband didn't want me to drive and I said honey I drove for two months with a boot on my left foot it's not a, my driving is not affected I haven't taken pain medication till the since the first night I came home from the hospital you know from the orthopedic center and it's been a week I'm perfectly capable if you can help me get in the car because I can bear no weight on my left foot for two weeks and um that's the biggest struggle. The surgery went fine. I have an incision about this long on the arch of my foot. We, we did a new dressing yesterday. Um, it doesn't hurt. It, I, I mean, it throbs a little. It ha there's, it's tight, it pulls, it's, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it's a one, right? Like it, I'm icing it, I'm staying on top of it, but I haven't, I haven't even taken, maybe twice I took ibuprofen, but just kind of because I'm precautionary. So the, the surgery went very well, although your, your person can't go in with you. So when you're done, the doctor doesn't go out and talk to your person, right? So he calls Ross in the car and says, hey, she's done, she'll be up. Can you pull in or, or if, if you went somewhere, whatever, can you come back and, and she'll be, you know, we'll bring her down in half an hour or whatever. And then he said to Ross, I had to repair the foot. I had to repair it more and and Ross was like oh okay and he said everything went fine 
But we don't really know what that means because I haven't seen him because I don't go back for two weeks to get my <laughs> stitches out. So I think that the tear or the, the pull away from the attachment at the heel, I'm not really sure what he had to repair um, more because my original understanding was that he was going to tear more purposefully the fascia to make it not be pulling all the time. And mine was hyper extended and I had a small tear and they usually tear it a little bit further or do a purposeful like snip in it. But I, I don't think that's what happened. <laughs> Which is strange because, but like Ross said, he said, I, you know, the guy was just like, it went great. She'll do fine. It won't be any problem. We'll see her in two weeks and kind of, you know, hung up and Ross didn't, just didn't think to say, plus he's, you know, concerned about coming to get me and picking me up and they wheel me down. And we got home and because I'm having hand surgery and this hand is great, but not fully healed and not fully strong crutches aren't great for me because this hand hurts and this hand is hurting a little and we knew that I was going to have this hand in a cast in 10 days so we got a scooter and I was going to use a knee scooter around the house and we have hardwoods in a lot of our house but the family room has a little carpet and the bedroom on your way to the bathroom and I was really struggling in the first day to kneel on the knee scooter because that's my new knee replacement. <laughs> and I have a plastic little disc kneecap that runs in a groove, a titanium groove, in, and you, you just can't kneel on it. It kind of, it, it's uncomfortable, it kind of hurts the skin. It, I, I don't know what to, how to explain it, but it, it, I, so I was doing all this adjusting on the scooter to try to find a place where I could kneel. There's a divot in the scooter, but the pad is pretty hard. So we got a pillow, I tried that. Then we got my foam pad that I have like a foam kneeling pad for if I ever have to kneel on the floor to do exercise at home or whatever. Um, and we put that on there, but it, you know, it was like this wide and the seat, you know, the knee thing is like this wide. So that has been the biggest issue is that I have to push so hard to make the scooter move on the carpet and, um, my right knee is starting to hurt and I have a right partial knee replacement that's 20 years old and when I got it they said it won't last forever and because I'm sitting up on the scooter we lowered the scooter way down we raised the scooter seat way up we lowered the handlebars like we've tried all the things I can fly on the hardwoods no problem but when I get on the carpet I really have to dig my heel in if I'm sitting and pull and that right knee started to bother me so we cut the foam pad in half and we wrapped it on with an ace bandage to try to get it more stable so that I don't tip or fall. And now my husband just pulls me or pushes me if I have to, if I have to go on the, hey bud, if I have to go on the carpet, um, he'll just grab the handlebars and get me to the hardwood. And then I can, I can go pretty well. And the reason that I'm really sticking with trying to make this knee scooter work is because my hand is going to be in a cast for seven days. So I'll only have one hand and one foot to really get me around. And I've just been doing a lot of sitting. And I feel like my foot, when we unwrapped it, was really atrophying. But I've been atrophying since February of last year. <laughs> it's a whole body atrophy. <laughs> Because my, I haven't been able to walk outside since, I don't know, March or April. And then I gave up dance in July when I couldn't do that anymore. And I just been sitting in the chair since September with uh, two months with my boot on. And I'm like, I've turned to like no muscle, right? Like there's just not a lot. So if I have to, if I'm in the recliner and I have to stand up, I have to stand with just one foot and one, kind of one hand. I don't like to push down on either one of these because it pushes right on the spot. And that takes a lot. So I was talking to my knitting group last Thursday and I said, when you guys all get up from your chair today, I want you to try to get up on one leg and no hands. Like, can you stand up? And my one friend who bikes all the time, she stood up, she could do it. She, but she said, I don't think I could do it from a soft chair, like in a family room. And, um, and no one else, <laughs> No one else chimed in like, oh yeah, Corey, that would be really hard. But I, like just standing up off the toilet 
with one leg and no like no hands or no like you kind of have to rock and give yourself a little oomph to get up onto that get up high enough Cody you're bumping so speaking of the toilet the first night home I've got the scooter and when you go into a kind of a long narrow bathroom like a lot of people and then you know the seats at the end so you come in forward and then you have to back out on the scooter which isn't it's not a driving machine so it's a little hard so you want to turn the scooter around so front forward back forward back forward back forward back so I'm on one foot and I'm newly home and um and I kind of um plopped onto the toilet seat and I broke it <laughs> and I heard it crack now granted my husband knows that the toilet seat has been loose and you know how the top of it kind of goes from side to side sometimes and you have to get down underneath and screw it down and a week ago we both said the toilet seat is loose and he goes I'll hand do it but then I have to go get a tool so it was loose and it was really it had been moving all weekend and why didn't dawn on me but I sat crooked and that it just slid over and I just sheared that sucker right off I'm lucky I didn't fall in I'm lucky I didn't fall on my new foot but then I'm sitting on it and I know it's broken and he's stepped out to the bedroom and I don't want to tell him I'm thinking I have to tell him you know I don't want to tell him because it's been a day right like we have had hand surgery we have two surgeries coming up it's a lot to just get me home and get me fed and get me dressed in my pajamas and, and you know that first night and they told you to take a pain med right away so we did because you want to get on top of it but I didn't, wouldn't have needed it so I'm a little and I honestly I did not jump up and land on my butt I just sat down a little too hard so we're getting ready for bed and he's I can tell he's fuming but he's really a nice guy and he's not gonna say anything but he's just like and he had had a crisis at work that day and he had been in the parking lot waiting for me for because my surgery was late in the afternoon and he had been he never stays up late it was 11 30 and we were trying to go to bed and he he in his head is going we're going to get up in the night and we're going to fall in the toilet we're going to one of us is going to get up in the night i'm going to get up and help we're just going to fall in the toilet i got to swap out the so at 11 30 at night my husband has to swap out the toilet seats from the back bathroom to this bathroom and the the master bathroom has a higher toilet seat which we had put in when i was having all my knee trouble because i would just struggle to get up with my bad knee and there you know we didn't want to drill handles into the wall so he you know got a, we have a unfinished basement so he put the old one down there to someday put a toilet and we have this taller seat in the bathroom by a bit so but he knew that the back one you know they make these plastic seat covers now they're not that old composite material right that's what you have to tell yourself that so he's got tools and he's you know he's going back and forth and I'm lying in the bed and he, he finally gets in the bed and I'm you know I've been sitting on the edge and then I prop my and I he gets the covers I get the covers and and I I'm wired like I have adrenaline just pumping my heart is pounding when I got to the surgery that day they're like wow your heart rate is and I said it's normally high she says I see there's a note in your chart but it's really high. do you think you could calm yourself I'm like yes let me take a few deep breaths and calm myself down I was just nervous and you know me I talk chatter 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 so I lay I lay my and I'm thinking there's no way I'm gonna fall asleep no way I'm gonna fall asleep and it dawns me I don't have a pillow under my knee or my foot and so I have to say to him honey I need a pillow <laughs> and he has to get up and get out of bed and get me a pillow and put it under my foot my knee to support it and that's not all so we had wrapped ice packs on it because they said really keep ice on it it wasn't wrapped up all that much I mean it had a wrapping on it but it wasn't like a boot I didn't have a boot or a cast or anything I, I have this night splint that he told me to sleep in so we had tucked this ice pack that they gave us down behind the boot and then it had straps on it so we tied it on 
the the bottom of my foot and then tied one on the top of my foot. And then I said to him, you know, when I roll over in the night, I'll throw them on the floor. And I I just laid there. I I, my, I just, my brain, and I laid there and laid there and laid there. I don't know what time I fell asleep. 2.30, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning. 3.30 in the morning, I wake up. And the bed is wet. My pajamas are wet. My dressing might be wet. The sock might be wet. The pillow is wet. The ice packs have melted and leaked all over the bed. The ice packs they sent us home with melted and leaked. And I can't fix it. I, like there's no way I can get up and get on this knee scooter that I'm just coming home to for the first time and get towels and get, I have to wake him up again. And I said, honey, and he, you know, he just jerks awake. He's like, what, you know what, you know? And I said, the bed is wet, the pillow is wet. And he's like, oh my Lord. So again, get up, turn all the lights on. We take the splint off, the pads are wet. He takes them to the dryer. We get new pajamas. My, my pajama leg on my left foot was sopping. Like I, I woke up because it, I was cold. It was, I, it could not have gone any worse from the time I got home until the next morning. Other than that, the surgery went fine and it was successful and I'm gonna be fine. Just, it was, I, I felt so, cause he has to get up in the morning and go to work right like he works from home now but he has to get up at seven and be or he gets up at five runs with the dog walks the dog uh one or the other every other day and then you know does breakfast and then he's in on the computer by oh at least by seven thirty, if not earlier and so i he was up late and then i had to wake him in the night so i knew i had a Corey story this week <laughs> I knew I had something to tell you guys, and I'm doing fine. But Kylie says to us, I feel like the same thing happened when you had surgery last time, Mom. You came home and everything kind of went wrong. Like you just didn't have, you know, your stuff together and things just kept happening. And I'm like, boy, I do not remember that. But I think that's surgical amnesia, right? You forget the... So I said, no, we're learning a lot. So now we got the the knee ice machine up out of the basement and we have um, ways to wrap that strap that on my foot and it is super cold and it never leaks and the water the ice stays in there forever and we have that ready for my hand and we have the going to bed thing where he lays the covers back because I come to bed a lot later than he does now and and then I come in and I'm in the dark I'm trying to come through the door we have uh, two doors that open into our be our bedroom and uh, and I try not to hit, and I, oh, the wheel goes bash into the door. And he's sleeping every other night. I think, oh, just go really slow and don't hit the door. Don't hit the doors. <laughs> Inevitably, I hit the door. So I'm doing fine. I'm um, I'm physically tired. Um, it it takes a lot of oomph to kind of get up and get get moving. Um, but I have a couple of. Um, friends from my knitting group that are bringing in meals on Mondays and Thursdays. God bless them because my husband's not much of a cook, but he also works until 5 30, 6 o'clock many nights. And so then to come out and start something, and it's not that I can't get to the kitchen. It's just that the standing of my right leg hasn't been great. And if I do it for long periods of time, I'm afraid I'm going to, when you stand on your foot and you need to turn that way, you kind of turn your foot because you can't put your other foot down and so you're you twist that knee and I just I want to be so careful with it so we talked about it and he said yeah no I don't I don't think you should be up on that right leg if it's gonna you know if it's bothering you at all we need to be more careful and I was like yeah it's bothering me <laughs> so my left one I can't kneel one and my right one is old <laughs> I'm old thank you all for your well which well wishes Thank you for your positive thoughts. A couple of you have sent me cards, which was so nice. Can't can't really say that it's not nice to get a little mail, a little pick-me-up. Somebody sent me a really nice little gift. You know who you are. 
DVM. That came today. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it everything's going fine, and um, I don't know if I'll be back in two weeks. And you know, depends if I get my stitches out and I'm bearing weight on my foot, that will be great. Then I can start walking as once I get my stitches out. And then I'll just have the hand, which is only in cast for about seven days, seven to 10 days. And then they take it off and I get my splint and my fingers are out. So, you know, I only have five days in there that it, I'll be really laid up. And so, and I'm not pressuring myself. I know a lot of you wrote and said, you know, don't worry about it. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. If I can come on, I'll come on. <sighs> Until next time, waddle on. That's about all I got. Waddle on. <laughs> I love you all.